My story starts in Boston, Massachusetts, when we boarded a ship called the Britannica. It normally carried 2,500 uh, people when it was on a cruise. They put 7,000 of us on board of this ship. It was in uh, the winter time, in January of 1944, and it was so cold that they told us they gave us a life uh, preserver, and second breath they told us says, if we have to abandon ship, your life expectancy is five minutes because hypothermia will set in and when you hit the water there. We went up close to Iceland and Greenland, down in between Ireland and into uh, Liverpool where we disembarked. Now, I was sick from the minute I put my foot on that ship until the minute I got my foot off that ship, seasick. And from there we went to southern England where we started our invasion training from the LSTs. We was a 546 ordnance. We had approximately 275 personnel. And each one of us had a section that we were in. We could maintain supposedly anything from a pocket watch to the largest tanks that uh, the Army had at that time. I was in what they call the instrument section. My duty was uh, to supply a height finder for aircraft. It was a tube about two feet in diameter and about 10 to 12 feet long. And when aircraft came over, you was looking through something like a pair of binoculars that you work the reticles until that would give you an altitude of those uh, aircraft. Then you'd send a message back to the uh, anti-aircraft batteries so they could cut their shells at that particular altitude to explode. But uh, we trained back and forth on the beach down in southern England of the invasion type. We would have to go in with uh, LSTs, which is landing ship tanks, because we were not supposed to be infantry. But we had the same training that the infantry had. And when we, our uh, company was, uh, was out, ordered to go to the uh, uh, France on D-Day, we were loaded onto LSTs. It took about three LSTs to haul our company. And uh, we uh, landed on the beach and there was so much noise you couldn't tell. You'd see sand picking up around your feet where a bullet or something was hitting pretty close to you. But some it got, some it didn't. I was one of the fortunate ones. And we were on the beach there, supposedly, it was supposed to have been holes there that the bombers came over and dropped the day before that we could get in. But if they dropped those bombs, the Germans filled them up before we got on the beach that day. We were with the 4th Infantry Division. And uh, after about six weeks, we finally cut our way through the hedgerows and the 4th Infantry went north to take Cherbourg, and uh, we joined the 3rd Army. And our first uh, move was with the 3rd Army to go to the fall to Fallacy. They called it the Fallacy Gap. Being ordnance didn't make a, th a bit of difference. We were as much infantry as a front-time infantry man was. We had to protect ourselves. Uh, as much as the infantry did. We followed them. And once we got there, the uh, Montgomery was supposed to come down from the north and close what they had been a pincer movement to trap about 300,000 Germans in there, which would shorten the war probably six months or longer. But Montgomery did not fulfill his obligation and they would not let us close the gap because of political reasons. They didn't want to make Montgomery look bad at, uh, for not closing the gap. So we finally, he finally got there, but 200,000 Germans got out. We had 100,000 that we uh, captured. And the Third Army moved on out through uh, 
Rim, Reman, R H I E M S, Reams, however you want to pronounce it. We went to Reims and then fought our way up to Metz, France. At Metz, the Germans stopped us cold. We could not even get close to the uh, city of Metz. And so Eisenhower called a meeting of his top three generals to uh, get a plan put together to get through Metz. Well, of course, our illustrious Patton, he got up and says, give me enough six by sixes to haul the dog tags back in, and says, I'll put you into Metz. Of course, Eisenhower was not wanting to destroy Metz because it had a rail junction, road junction, airport, all there. He wanted it so that we could use it. Well, this was in December, and about the 15th, was when the Germans began their push at Bastogne. And the Third Army, everything that the Third Army had went to Bastogne. And the weather had closed in. It was cold, it was raining, it was sleeting, it was snowing. And snow got to a point of probably two, maybe three feet deep. And we didn't have any clothing that was per, uh, equipment, have the equipment that we needed to stay warm. Basically, just our regular clothes was all we had. And uh, there was about 140,000 casualties at Bastogne. Most of it was from the uh, frozen feet. And uh, I had an extra pair of socks. So I would uh, put the socks on that was dry, put the other ones around my waist and dry them out and kept rotating them so that I did not have any frostbite or anything of that nature. But the, uh, the Germans was determined to go through Bastogne. They wanted to get up to Antwerp to close off the uh, harbor up there because they thought that they'd give them a better chance then to attack England and more or less bring a war to some sort of a armistice or something. But uh, we, we managed to to hold the uh, Bastogne there. It was all around. Uh, they also had the 101st and the 82nd that came in. And somewhere around about uh, 15th, maybe the 10th of January, the weather let up a little bit. That's when the warplanes could come in, especially the P-47s, which was tank busters. And they could get to the German tanks that was around there. And uh, finally, after a few days of that, the Germans began to uh, retreat because that was their last hurrah. But uh, my outfit went on uh, up to Liège, Belgium, and through Liège, and then come back down through uh, part of uh, Holland. And by that time, they knew that the war was pretty well winding down. They sent my outfit down to Marseille, France, that we were going to the Pacific. But uh, we were there for several months, and they dropped the two atomic, atomic bombs, and uh, that was our last hurrah. We did not have to go to the Pacific and uh, they did transfer us back up to La Havre, France. They had staging areas up there named after cigarettes, like Philip Morris, Campbell, Lucky Strike, and uh, we were in one of those for about a week. Finally, we got aboard ship. It was a Liberty ship, and uh, headed back home. Of course, my usual seasickness, I was sick 14 days coming back to the States, but I was sure happy to see the Statue of Liberty. We, uh, when we get, came in to uh, disembark, the longshoreman was on strike there in New York. And uh, on the pier, there was hundreds of people there. They knew that uh, they had brothers and relatives on that ship. And those longshoremen was parading around that they weren't gonna unload any ships. So a group of the hefty men walked up to him and said, we're going to give you one choice. 
Either you bring that ship in unloaded or you're going to go for the longest swim you ever had. So they got together and they brought us in and unloaded us and went across the river there to uh, uh, another camp. I can't remember the name of it. But they disbursed us there back to, uh, most of us came back to Atlanta at Fort McPherson to be discharged and returned to our respective homes. Yeah, and that was the 19th. I was discharged January the 14th, 1946.